Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're about ready to get started for today, even though it is one minute early of Michigan time. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today to our first uh, Precision Health Seminar. Uh, my name is Vicki Ellingrod. I am the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education in the College of Pharmacy and also one of the co-leads of the Precision Health um, Education Committee as part of the Precision Health Initiative. Um, this uh, Precision Health Initiative is, is really exciting. It was launched about one year ago um, this month, uh, in fact. It is uh, supported uh, by the President's Office as well as the Provost's Office, um, as well as the Founding Schools, the School of Medicine, the uh, College of Engineering, the School of Public Health, and then the College of Pharmacy. Um, we're really working on building infrastructure to enable interdisciplinary precision health research with unique tools and resources um, available across campus. Um, and we're encouraging research um, through different funding and educational opportunities, as well as supporting effective implementation of a lot of the research findings that are coming out of precision health into real life healthcare settings. So uh, for today, the format for today is we're gonna have our first speaker who needs to then um, do question and answers for her presentation. So our first speaker today is Dr. Jenna uh, Means, who is the Morris Wellman Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan. Her primary research interests lie in the intersection of machine learning, data mining, and healthcare. She's interested in time series analysis and transfer multitask learning. The overarching goal of her research agenda is to develop the computational methods needed to help organize, process, and transform patient data into actionable knowledge. Dr. Weems received her PhD from MIT in 2014, and then in 2015, she was named Forbes 30 under 30 in science and healthcare, and she received an NSF Career Award in 2016, and was recently named to the MIT Teach Reviews list of innovators under 35. She also serves as the co-lead for the Data Analytics and IT Workshop for the Precision Health um, Initiative. Her title today is Artificial Intelligence for Open. She changes AI for Health, a partnership between clinician, patient, and data. Okay, right. thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so thank you for inviting me and thank you all for coming um, to hear me speak today. So I did change the title very um, um, slightly. I'm still going to be talking about AI for Health though, but it's more about a partnership between the clinician, the patient, and the data. All right, so the data. So in today's hospitals, we're collecting an immense amount of patient data. Everything from what medications a patient's on to genetic information and imaging data. And while clinicians are spending ever more time entering data about their patients and studying data about their patients, we're still ignoring the vast majority of it. So in my group, we develop and we use machine learning techniques to look for patterns in all these data. Patterns that we can then use to sort patients from low risk to high risk for a particular adverse outcome or disease. And these types of clinical decision support tools are crucial given the challenges that today's healthcare system is facing. So currently the demand for clinical care far exceeds the supply. And economists anticipate this is only going to get worse in the years to come. So by the year 2025, they anticipate a shortage of over 100,000 clinicians. And this shortage exacerbates what's already a serious issue in the field, clinician burnout, right? So like I said, clinicians are spending so much time entering and studying data about their patients but we're still ignoring the vast majority of it. And this burnout combined with a lack of tools to make sense of all the data contributes to a large number of medical errors. So the CDC now estimates medical errors as one of the top three contributors to death in the US following heart disease and cancer. So these issues highlight an important need but also an opportunity for artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. The opportunities for AI in health are vast. From a data perspective, there's 
seemingly unlimited number of technical challenges. And in my lab, we work across a number of different domains within machine learning. So everything from time series analysis, to transfer learning, to causal inference. And while we're motivated or focused on making technological advances in machine learning, ultimately we care about important clinical problems in which AI can help augment clinical care. And so one project in which we've been able to make considerable progress is in predicting which patients are at greatest risk of acquiring an infection during their hospital stay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that project, and then I'm going to jump down to more recent work in diabetes. So C. diff, or Clostridium difficile, is one of the most common types of healthcare-associated infections in the U.S. C. diff is a type of bacteria that takes over the gut when normal flora gets wiped out. It can lead to colitis, inflammation of the colon, and even death. It's associated with excess medical costs of over $4 billion. So this slide's a little bit outdated. It's more expensive than that. It's associated with a number of deaths as well. And we hypothesize that one of the reasons this disease remains so stubbornly prevalent in hospitals today is because we lack an effective tool for measuring patient risk. So we took a data-centric approach to the problem in which we leverage the contents of the electronic health record with the goal of learning a model that could accurately sort patients from low risk to high risk. And this is their risk of acquiring one of their infections, one of these infections during their current hospital stay. Within the EHR, we have vast amount of clinical data. So we know what medications the patient's taking, so what antimicrobials they were on. We know what procedures they've undergone. We know where they are in the hospital and who's in the bed next to them. We know who's treating that patient. We have data on lab results, on vitals, on demographics, on patient history to the extent that it's available within the system, and admission details. So while others have looked at this problem, in contrast to prior work, we don't limit ourselves to a small number of potential risk factors. Instead, we leverage the entire structured contents. We throw everything in. Instead of making a single prediction per patient in time, we make multiple predictions and we consider how the risk of a patient changes as they're moved around the hospital, as their meds are changed in and out. <coughs> and finally, instead of this trend of a one-size-fits-all model, we focus on hospital-specific models, okay, tailored to the population at that institution. Why would we do this? Well, once you have a model train, say, on the patients at Michigan, there's no reason to believe that model will necessarily transfer to the patients at MGH. Why? Well, differences in clinical protocol, differences in the physical layouts of the hospital, right? which is especially important when you're considering an infectious disease. Differences in the electronic health record system. Right? Not everyone is on EPIC. These two in institutions happen to be now, um, but they weren't always. And even if you are on the same system, if you have two variables, um, say one at Michigan and one at MGH, even if they're named the same thing, there's no reason to believe that they actually are encoding the same thing because people have biases as they enter the data. So we're moving away from this generalizable model, this one size fits all model, and instead proposing a generalizable approach to train institution or hospital specific models. So we showed how our approach could be applied at two different institutions with different patient populations and different EHR systems. So this was Michigan and MGH. And we leveraged the contents of over 200,000 patient admissions. And we see that there are slight differences in these two populations. Um, in particular, if we look at the CDI rate, um, so C. diff infection 
rate. It's slightly higher um, at Michigan relative to MGH, and that may be in part due to the fact that different exclusion criteria were applied to get both of these study populations because the hospitals cared about different things. And then we represented each day of a patient admission as a high dimensional feature vector. So at Michigan, we had nearly 5,000 features. Okay, this again encodes meds, lab results, location, staff. Um, and then we looked at whatever we had at both institutions. So, but we didn't limit ourselves to just the intersection. So we had more detailed information on the vitals and the medications at Michigan. So we used those data. We had more detailed information on the healthcare staff at MGH. So we used those data. We didn't limit ourselves to just that intersection, that overlap, because then we wouldn't be using the data that we had. Right, so again, we're looking for this generalizable approach, not necessarily a generalizable one-size-fits-all model. So what does our model output? Well, essentially, we get a prediction, so an estimate of the patient's risk of acquiring an infection with C. diff during the remainder of the hospitalization that's updated each day based on the contents of the EHR. Then, after we apply some decision threshold, once the patient crosses that decision threshold, we can classify them as high risk. Okay? This gives us many opportunities to get it wrong because a low risk patient has to stay under this decision threshold for every single day of their admission. And depending on the length of admission, for some patients we're making more predictions, for some patients we're making fewer pred predictions. So applied to data, held out test data from the most recent year at each institution, we show that we can achieve good discriminative performance. Um, in fact, we are able to achieve an AURC of 0.82 at Michigan. We still did well, just not quite as well at MGH, and we believe this was in part due to the smaller size of training data. Now if we pick a point on this ROC curve, so one that corresponds to a low false positive rate, because remember the average, we're seeing about a rate of 1% of CDI, right? So for every 100 patients, only one ends up getting an infection. It's relatively rare. Um, so we really, because of this class imbalance, can only tolerate a very low false positive rate. So we'd wanna be operating somewhere down here. So we pick that point and we can get a confusion matrix. So this gives us a sense of if we were to classify based on that threshold, what would be our specificity? What would be our sensitivity? And what would be our positive predictive value? Okay, so our specificity is very high, our sensitivity is modest, and our positive predictive value looks low. Right? It's about 5%. Um, but again, keep in mind that CDI in this population was 1% or less. Okay? It was about 0.8 at MGH. So we're still, with this model, identifying a population that's at five to six times the baseline risk. In addition, um, it's really important that you look at not just the discriminative performance of the model, but how far in advance the model accurately identifies patients as high risk. Because if your model only identifies a patient at high risk an hour before they're diagnosed, it's not terribly useful, even if the discriminative performance is very high. Right? So here, we showed that on average, both models correctly predicted CDI five days in advance of any clinical suspicion. So this wasn't even diagnosis, this is when they ordered the lab test. So you can go and download our code, all of our code's available online, um, and you can train one of these models um, using Michigan data or um, another institution's data. And we're now working um, with clinicians here and antimicrobial stewardship teams here um, to look at uh, possible clinical studies using this model. Okay? And by using this model, you can identify that high risk population and run a clinical study more effectively. Okay? A lot of the studies to look at the effectiveness 
of interventions or prevent preventative measures um, have come back inconclusive um, because they don't get enough patients because the prevalence is so low. Um, and this would help with that issue. But where do we go from here? Right, so ideally, we'd want to improve the performance or improve the utility of the model even more before we deploy it. Right? One way to do that would be to add more data. Hey, let's wait an extra year, let's get more data, let's train on more data. That might lead to a small improvement in the discriminative performance of the model. But it's not clear what the clinical improvement or clinical utility of that would be. So through our work with clinicians, we've identified a number of key characteristics that we believe are necessary for the safe and meaningful adoption of such tools. So in addition to being accurate or getting it right, the model should be credible. Okay, they should agree at least in part with what's known in the clinical literature. They should be robust and able to adapt to changes over time, right? So if I deploy this model tomorrow, and things start to change, and all of a sudden there's a shift in the population, I'd like to at least be alerted to this fact. And the model should be actionable, telling us not only who is at risk, but how to reduce a patient's risk. So to achieve these characteristics, we'll certainly need big data. We'll definitely need machine learning. But I think we'll also need domain expertise. So in my group, we've been working on developing techniques that incorporate domain expertise in the models, either in the design of the model architectures themselves or directly um, in the objective function of the model. And I think this is really critical in healthcare because even if we have data on every patient in the world, there are some diseases that are just so rare you're not going to have enough data to learn meaningful relationships from those data alone. And you need to leverage the domain expertise of, say, your collaborators. Right? So recently, we've shown that domain expertise regarding known relationships can be incorporated in such a way that it leads to not only more interpretable models, but also models that are more credible. So this is work done by one of my PhD students, Joshua Wang. So for example, many users seek interpretable models in healthcare. So these are models that tell us not only who's at risk, but why the specific patient's at risk. And to achieve this type of interpretability, researchers will focus on the average complexity of the rules, okay, so they might prefer a linear model over a nonlinear model, and the size of the rule set. So if I can tell you who's at risk using a handful of variables rather than 10,000 variables, it's ultimately more interpretable. So in high dimensional settings like our own, to decrease the size of the rule set, researchers will use regularization techniques like L1, or sorry, L2 and L1. Okay, so here I'm just giving you the generic um, objective function. So here I've got loss, which is a proxy for training error or how well I fit my data. So I want to minimize my training error. I want to minimize loss, subject to some regularization penalty that essentially controls the complexity of the model. Okay, so L2, you might know as it is ridge, lasso, L1, um, are common regularization techniques. Now L1, because of its diamond shape, encourages sparsity in the set of parameters. So you're trying to learn these coefficients. So you might think of these coefficients as being coefficients in a logistic regression model. And what you'd want is many of those coefficients to be set to exactly zero, so that you have a very sparse model and only a few of those coefficients are non-zero. Okay, this will make your model more interpretable, in theory. The problem with L1 is while it does encourage sparsity in the parameter space, if you have two perfectly correlated features, lasso may randomly eliminate one. And this can lead to a lot of confusion when you're reviewing the factors, the top factors, top risk factors in your model. So here I just rank them according to their coefficients, and you start to see weird things. Okay, so you believe the first one. 
CD di CDI diagnosis in the past year increases your risk of getting C. diff again. Um, having a temperature or a fever increases your risk. But what's up with this variable? Right? It looks strange, and then the clinician starts to question the model, right? or doesn't trust the model. Because there's certain variables that we know have a relationship with increasing risk of CDI. But this variable might just be highly correlated with another variable okay, that we know <coughs> causes CDI. So given that there are these, there is this domain expertise or this knowledge, can't we find a way to incorporate this knowledge in the model so that we don't see these sorts of weird things, but the variables that are known to be important trickle up near the top? Okay, so that's in fact what we did. So we proposed a new regularization technique that's a combination of L1 and L2 that uses expert knowledge. So for every feature in our feature vector describing our patient, we have a binary variable that's zero or one that tells us whether or not that variable is a known risk factor for C. diff. Okay, so for example, things like clindamycin are known risk factors for C. diff, so we want to include that information in the regularization term. And I won't go into all the technical details, they're in the paper, but at a high level, what this regularization technique does is it favors a sparse solution in the set of unknown variables and a dense solution in the set of known variables. Okay, so we end up with this contour plot that's I-shaped, so we called it the I penalty, and we're more likely to select those known features, setting the unknown features to zero. So this leads to not only more credible models, but also more interpretable models and more robust models. Since if you have two variables that are highly correlated, that correlation can be very fragile and it can break over time. So you're better off incorporating the variable that has a known causal relationship with the outcome. So again, all our code is online. You can go to our GitHub. Um, and download the code and start training your own credible models. All right, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, excellent. So up to this point, I've only talked about data that we're collecting inside hospitals, right? electronic health record data. But we all know that health and disease is largely influenced by factors outside the hospital, the environment, your location, activity. And so, in particular, diabetes is an increasingly prevalent issue associated with costs of nearly $250 billion. It affects nearly one in every 10 patients in the U.S., and its prevalence is increasing globally. And currently, patients with diabetes are classified as one of two types. So type 1, in which the body doesn't make enough insulin, and type 2, in which the body can't use the insulin it does produce properly. So what can AI do? Right? How can we help patients with diabetes and the clinicians who treat them? Well, let me first present some data. So patients with type 1 diabetes will frequently monitor their blood glucose or their blood sugar. So here I'm showing you a plot of the daily fluctuations over a month long period. So this is from February to March. And this is data collected using a continuous glucose monitor, so CGM data, which is continuously recording at regular five-minute intervals. And ideally, the patient wants to hit some target blood glucose of about 125 or 120, depending on the patient, and stay within these bands. And you want to minimize the number of hyper or hypoglycemic events, because those can be very dangerous. So this patient's doing pretty well from February to March. If we go just one month later, we see that the average glucose has increased, okay, and there are more hyperglycemic events. So what changed? Well, from pr the perspective of the patient, nothing. She continued, she was very diligent, measuring her blood glucose, um, entering the carbs she had had, uh, and 
From her perspective, she was treating herself in the same way and making decisions in the same way as she had done the month before. So she was extremely frustrated to see that she wasn't able to control her blood glucose as well. And this is not uncommon because of the number of factors that can affect blood glucose levels. Okay? Everything from what food you're eating to activities, or are you training for a marathon, um, to environmental and biological. How much sleep did you get? Okay. So many of these factors change regularly, right? Even on a daily basis. But patients aren't meeting with their endocrinologists on a daily basis, right? Many of them will meet with them only a few times a year, okay? which doesn't seem to be often enough. So what can we do? Well, this is where AI comes in. This is where AI can help. So the ultimate goal would be an artificial pancreas. So this is a closed loop system in which we can predict and deliver the appropriate amount of insulin okay? and make patient-specific predictions based on all of these different data feeds. So a step in that direction is just simply being able to forecast blood glucose values. So we recently presented work at KDD um, this past August in predicting both hyper and hypoglycemic events. So we were forecasting um, blood glucose values. So this is work done by one of my graduate students, Ian Fox. So this is deep multi-step forecasting, learning to accurately predict blood glucose trajectories. Here, I'll just give you the high-level idea since we're running out of time. Instead of just predicting one point in the future, we aim to predict the trajectory or how the patient will get there. Since ultimately, it's not just where I end up, but how I got there. Did I have to go hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic first? So we aim to predict actually multiple values into the future simultaneously. Now there's two main ways to do this. One is recursive in which given data up until time t, you use that to make a prediction at time t plus one, and then you feed this prediction into the model to make a prediction at time t plus two, and so on. Okay, so you sort of daisy chain your predictions together. Unfortunately, this can lead to error accumulation. So any error here gets passed on to this prediction here. So one way around that is to predict at each time step independently. Okay? But we know that from one time step to, the another, to another, they're not independent. So again, what we did was we proposed a multi-step forecasting solution that sequentially decodes a latent representation, Z, okay? so introducing some relationship between the time points, but not complete dependence while constraining the output to an nth degree polynomial. I don't have time to go into all of the details. You can find them in our KDD paper that's available online. Um, in short, it worked. It did better um, than the baseline. So here I'm just showing you the error um, and we're beating the baseline, both recursive and multi-output deep models. We also compared some shallow models in the paper. Um, so I'm really excited about where this work is going. Okay, so this was forecasting using just CGM data. We're now starting to look at in including additional signals from activity, from food intake, um, from things like sleep. Uh, and I think that it's an opportunity to not only you know, enable clinicians, which is really what the first part of the talk was about, but also enable patients and okay, to make better or more appropriate decisions. So going forward, I believe that really considering the whole picture, so data collected both inside and outside the hospital, will be able to augment clinical care to achieve our ultimate goal of improving patient health. Uh, in summary, there's a critical need for AI in healthcare. And by augmenting clinical practice, AI has the potential to reduce costs and medical errors through decision support tools. And to achieve this goal, we'll need data and we'll need machine learning techniques, but we'll also need domain expertise. I want to emphasize that our goal is not to replace clinicians. I believe we need this clinical expertise to not only 
deliver clinical care, but also help inform our models. So by working together, we can achieve more useful and meaningful models that ultimately improve patient care. So with that, I'd like to thank my students, collaborators, and funding sources. So we work very closely with all of our clinical collaborators on this problem. Um, and I hope, you know, today, the increasing computerization of the field is still cited as a problem rather than a solution. And I hope by working together, we can change that. Thank you. Time for one question. Is there a question? Please, questions. Yes. Going back to the beginning bit on predicting um, uh, patient risks for, like, um, for diseases within hospitals, there's the, you talked about the decision threshold. Um, could you elaborate more on like, what's important for choosing a, a meaningful decision threshold? Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent question um, and is very application dependent. Um, and intervention dependent. So here we're talking about C. diff, the class imbalance is really high, um, so we typically want a high decision threshold so that we have a lower false positive rate. But we also want to take into account what the intervention is, right? Because that will dictate what false positive rate we can tolerate. So if my intervention is put everyone in a private room that's a very limited resource, um, I can tolerate a very low false positive rate there. Right? But if I have um, a safer, cheaper, less risky um, intervention, say yogurt, maybe I can tolerate a much higher false positive rate um, and give more patients yogurt. So it depends on what the intervention is, and you'd have to do a careful cost-benefit analysis before um, deploying any intervention. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So our next speaker is Dr. James Moon, who is the John Gideon Searle Associate Professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan. His translational research program aims to develop novel strategies for improving vaccines and immunotherapies. His work has led to two new biotech companies, Vendantra Pharmaceuticals, which is in Cambridge, and EVOQ Therapeutics, which is here in Ann Arbor. Both of these companies focus on clinical translation of new nano vaccine technologies. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moon has been recognized with numerous awards, including a 2018 Emerging Leader Award from the American Association of Pharmaceutical Sciences, the 2017 Emerald Foundation Distinguished Investigator Award, 2016 NSF Career Award, and a 2016 Department of Defense Career Development Award. Dr. Moon received his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD from Rice University, who, and then he went on to complete his postdoctoral training at MIT. The title of his presentation today is Toward Personalization of Cancer Immunotherapy. All right, thank you very much, Vicki. Uh, thank you for all being here, and uh, uh, it's quite exciting to uh, be in the inaugural session for uh, this Precision Health. Uh, so, uh, my lab is working on cancer immunotherapy, and I think this is very timely because, as you know, um, last week, Nobel laureate uh, in medicine went to Jim Allison and Dr. Honjo, uh, who uh, discovered immune checkpoint blockers. Uh, that's the uh, cornerstone of cancer immunotherapy in oncology. Uh, so, I'll uh, briefly touch upon on their work as well as what we are doing in uh, my laboratory. And uh, this is for uh, full disclosure. The technology that I'll talk about um, uh, is um, uh, being translated in uh, Evoke Therapeutics, and I serve as a CSO there. Uh, so as I mentioned before, cancer immunotherapy is revolutionizing oncology. Uh, as you know, chemotherapeutics, surgery, radiation can uh, ha have been the cornerstone of oncology for many decades. But immune checkpoint blockers, uh, these are monoclonal antibodies that allow T cells to uh, kill cancer cells, is a radical solution for a lot of um, uh, difficult to treat uh, cancer types. 
And this is uh, illustrated here. This is uh, um, advanced melanoma patients uh, that are treated with immune checkpoint blockers. Uh, without this antibody treatments, they would all succumb to the tumor within a couple of years. But with this immune checkpoint blocker antibody, now we have uh, uh, this tale where a lot of patients are considered cured even after five years of this treatments. And this is all driven by uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 antibodies that are um, basically the subject of the Nobel uh, Laureate uh, Award in Medicine this year. Basically, this is how uh, they work. Uh, within tumor cells, uh, when tumor cells undergo uh, apoptosis or necrosis, they release proteins in the milieu that's picked up by immune cells. And then immune cells uh, try to elicit uh, immune responses against these antigens. Uh, by inducing T cells. These are killer uh, white blood cells in blood, basically. And when these uh, killer cells enter the tumor, they try to kill cancer cells that have this expression of a protein, but uh, they are often exhausted uh, due to negative feedback loop on uh, cancer cells. And this uh, immune checkpoint blockers, uh, Yovoic, Chura, Aptivo, these are uh, monoclonal antibodies that uh, come in between T cells and tumor cells and allow exhausted white immune cells to resume killing their target uh, cancer cells. But as you can see, uh, there are much more uh, uh, areas for improvement. Uh, we only see about 30% of patients are uh, uh, being cured with immune checkpoint blockers. And the overall, the field is trying to increase this patient response rates from 20 to 30 percent all the way to hopefully 100 percent. And one of the areas that people are working on is combination immunotherapy. Can we combine vaccines or other chemotherapeutic agents in, in, uh, together with immune checkpoint blockers to increase patient response rates? Uh, so that's uh, what my lab is working on. Uh, briefly. Uh, Today I'll talk about personalized approach in all this um, uh, strategy where we are taking uh, tumor uh, mutated antigens and then come up with a personalized uh, patient tailored vaccination approaches uh, so that when we combine with the immune checkpoint blocker we can increase uh, patient's response rates. And if I have time at the end I will talk about uh, chemotherapeutic uh, approaches as well. But on the first side how do we come up with a personalized uh, vaccine that will go after uh, mutated antigens? Uh, so this is uh, NCI's data looking at number of mutations in different cancer types. Uh, on the y-axis, you have a number of mutations. And if you look at melanoma and lung, uh, they have uh, uh, accumulated a lot of mutations, uh, sometimes up to 300 mutants uh, per tumor DNA. And that's due, due to uh, smoking and UV radiation, for example. So if you have a lot of mutations, how can you leverage that information for personalized immunotherapy? A lot of these mutated proteins are chopped into peptides and then presented on the surface of tumor cells for uh, recognition by immune cells. So if you can imagine doing uh, DNA, RNA sequencing of your tumor uh, cells, and then identifying these uh, point mutations uh, that's shown in the previous slide and predict which of these um, mutated proteins will be presented as a fragment on the surface of tumor cells. Now you can think about coming up with a personalized uh, vaccination approach. And uh, this was uh, uh, first shown in mouse models only three years ago um, uh, by various immunology groups. And uh, only two years, uh, last year basically, uh, that's led to phase one clinical trials in advanced melanoma patients. And what they're doing is they are once again taking tumors out uh, during primary resection from melanoma patients, doing RNA DNA sequencing, predicting which of the antigen is presented on the tumor cells, and then coming up with the vaccines. And they have sh shown some uh, promising uh, clinical efficacy. But we see there's a major limitation in this um, um, approach of uh, developing drugs that are tailored to everyone's um, uh, tumor mutanum. One of the main uh, limitation is when you come up with the vaccines and then give that as uh, just a free drug, what happens is a lot of it gets washed away into systemic circulation, and that's not where you, are, uh, uh, where you want your vaccines to go to. 
Uh, you want your vaccines to go to lymph nodes where a lot of immune cells are situated to elicit strong uh, T cell responses. So in our lab, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Anna Schwendemann, we came up with a, a nanoparticle system that can carry these mutated new antigens from injection site to lymph nodes in a very efficient manner. So right after doing sub q injection with these systems, uh, we see they are entering the lymph vessels, uh, delivering whatever is attached on them, including new antigens that I mentioned, uh, to immune cells in lymph nodes, and then we get very robust uh, killer T cell responses. And the benefit of this system is this is uh, made of a synthetic high-density lipoprotein, uh, no, also known as um, a good cholesterol that we all have in our body. But rather than coming up with a complex formulation, we just have a fat molecule, phospholipid, and short uh, peptide, 20 tumor peptides that has alpha helical structures uh, that form into this nano disc shaped uh, uh, um, uh, nanoparticles. And this actually went through phase uh, one clinical trials uh, here in Ann Arbor. Uh, they went through manufacturing processes and trying to use this to reduce bad cholesterol in cardiovascular patients. So we have a, a trove of data of how to manufacture them in good qualities and we have a good human uh, safety data as well. And uh, based on this uh, proven uh, platform, what we are proposing is to use this for a personalized uh, cancer immunotherapy uh, 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 strategies. And I'll, I'll go through uh, technical details here. So we designed these nanodisc systems that's made of just phospholipid and peptide, very simple to make by heat and cooling cycle. And then we attach the um, mutated antigen that I described from tumor cells. And then we put um, adjuvant molecules into this using cholesterol uh, DNA-based adjuvant that basically elicits and alerts immune system that there is uh, some kind of infection ongoing. So when you combine these together, what we have is um, uh, very tiny nanoparticles that have both mutated tumor antigen plus adjuvant molecule that's very homogeneous, and we can readily store filter store for many months as a frozen vials, and then when we take them out, they maintain the original shape and size. So this is what we are envisioning, uh, that we would make a very large batch of um, HDL system, which we know from our previous experience in clinical trials, and then freeze them as individual oliplots. And when patients' uh, DNA, RNA uh, information is available, we would predict new antigens uh, by, by informatics, and then take those vials out, and then formulate our uh, cocktail of new antigens that's tailored to everyone's uh, tumor DNA. And we uh, expect this nanodisc to have a very potent efficacy. And I'll, I'll go, you, go through some series of immunological data set, but I'll quickly um, go over this. <coughs> Uh, when we incubate uh, the traditional vaccine into immune cells known as dendritic cells, what happens is uh, the dendritic cells engulf them, present antigens on the cell membrane, but they get rapidly degraded away. But with our nanodisc system, we see much better uh, uptake as well as display up to uh, long uh, 20, uh, 48 hours, uh, showing that we get this uh, prolonged antigen presentation uh, shown in the blue curves, as opposed to rapid degradation for the traditional peptide formulation. And this works really well in uh, mouse models, as I'll share. If you inject this nanodisc at subcutaneous base and look at where they are going, a lot of it goes to draining lymph nodes, and we see about 28-fold increase in terms of a vaccine delivery to the right tissues, as opposed to giving the traditional free peptide vaccination. And if we immunize mice using this system, we get very striking level of T cell responses. Here we are looking at the frequency of T cells that, that can recognize the antigen of choice we are delivering. And after single, second, and third round of vaccination, what we are showing in blue is that the nanodisc is uh, generating very robust T cell responses where up to a quarter of all immune cells in mouse blood are single antigen specific. And this is uh, far better than the leading adjuvant systems out there that we use as a gold standard shown in uh, green, uh, and that is in number of clinical trials. So compared to that, we are getting far better uh, immune responses. 
And we, here we used uh, these uh, tumor mutated new antigens and put it into the nano disk. And once again, shown that we get about 30 fold better induction of T cells without any adaptive transfer uh, of T cells, uh, showing uh, their uh, good efficacy. So how does this week, uh, work in uh, tumor bearing animals? So that's the main question we are trying to answer. So if you implant tumor cells, colon carcinoma in mice, and then treat them using our mono vaccine, what we see in blue line is uh, animals are controlling tumors, and we see extension of animal survival as opposed to giving the same type of vaccines in a traditional formulation. Uh, showing that our nanodisc delivering this uh, new antigens uh, is extending animal survival. But as I mentioned in the intro, uh, when T cells enter tumor microenvironment, they get exhausted. And we have seen that using our flow cytometry as well. Uh, so logically, we combined our vaccine with our immune checkpoint blocker that I mentioned earlier. And when we do, uh, in the same colon carcinoma model, we see now up to 90% of mice are eradicating tumors away when they're given the nano disc plus immune checkpoint blockers. And that is far better than the traditional peptide vaccine as a free form plus immune checkpoint blocker where we only have a 30% response rates. Uh, so that's quite exciting, but what's even more exciting is uh, that we can establish long-term immune responses against a tumor just as in the case of um, uh, uh, childhood vaccination. So if you take the survivors uh, from this initial uh, challenge and then give tumor cells again on day 70, these survivors are 100% protected against the tumor recurrence uh, given either IV or sub-Q route, uh, showing that we can not only eliminate primary tumors, but also prevent tumor recurrence in our uh, preclinical models. And this is uh, quite exciting data because uh, we are basically showing that we have a now platform uh, technology that can work with the multiple tumor antigens uh, if we just uh, change, our, change our peptide sequences. Uh, so we have also shown that this works in uh, other tumor models, including melanoma. And this is a quite uh, interesting model because this is very tough to treat using conventional immune checkpoint blockers, conventional uh, approaches. But when we combine our nanodisc system delivering multiple antigens uh, plus a dual immune checkpoint blocker, anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4, once again, we see up to 90% of mice uh, eradicating tumors away when they are given nanodisc system. But if you uh, uh, untreat these mice, they develop huge tumors. Uh, if you treat them using conventional free peptide vaccination with immune checkpoint blocker, uh, they develop huge melanoma tumors as well. Uh, and we have also shown this in a, another tumor model, glioblastoma multiform, uh, deadly uh, brain cancer. Uh, basically, when we change the sequences of the peptides to a GBM-specific peptide, now we can eliminate uh, this uh, GBM tumor cells in mice when we combine with anti pdl one where we get very strong uh, T cell responses that translates to 100% survival uh, in this uh, tumor model. So we are very excited about these uh, uh, mouse uh, preclinical data, and we are uh, teaming up with uh, the same group that I mentioned uh, where they are doing phase one clinical trials in melanoma patients uh, to take in their uh, patients' uh, melanoma antigens into our nanodisc and then immunize humanized mice and ask the question whether our nanodisc can elicit T cells that will recognize human melanoma new antigens. And the answer is yes. Uh, basically, up to 7% of all T cells in these humanized mice can recognize the human new antigens after vaccination with the nanodisc. And this is far better than what's known as the best adjuvants in immunology, complete Froden's adjuvant plus tetanus toxoid. It's a very toxic, very potent adjuvant, uh, but compared with that, we are giving, getting about 20-fold better induction of T cells. Uh, so we are uh, quite encouraged by these results. So to summarize uh, this work, uh, we came up with a, a very simple uh, formulation uh, that have been tried in phase one clinical trials in cardiovascular space, but we are repurposing it for a personalized cancer immunotherapy, where we, would propose, we are proposing to make a large batch uh, and then identify new antigens and formulate them in a personalized manner and using this, we get very strong 
uh, uh, induction of T cell responses. So we are now uh, transi transitioning to uh, monkey studies as we speak. Uh, and uh, we started a company called Evoke Therapeutics to uh, uh, push this forward. And what's really exciting about this work is, um, as you know, a lot of cancer patients that are admitted to uh, Rajal Cancer Center elect to get their DNA, RNA sequenced. And through uh, work from, from Arul Shinayan, he has established MyOncoSeq to um, analyze the tumor DNA. So with the data set is there, we just have to mine the data to find these uh, mutated new antigens, uh, predict which one will be presented on the tumor cells, and once we have that sequence, we can readily uh, formulate our personalized vial of vaccine that will hopefully uh, eradicate the tumors. And we are working hard to uh, start phase one clinical trials in the uh, Rajal Cancer Center. So with that, maybe I'll just skip this part uh, uh, on chemotherapeutics, since we are out of time. Um, and I want to thank the members in the lab who uh, have done the work. Uh, Dr. Rui Kwai, who was a very talented graduate student who did the work, as well as uh, Lin Jishitz, uh, Xiaoxi, and Cheng, who are uh, taking on this project. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Right. Yes, Carl. How are you? I was um, particularly interested in the data with the GBMs and noticed that you used a blank tumor model. Do you think there would be any difference if you did a um, orthotopically in the brain? Any immune implications there? Yes, uh, Lin Ji is a graduate student who's working on that, doing orthotopic tumor models. Um, we are seeing about 30% of the T cells in blood are single antigen specific, and we are hoping that they would uh, cross BBB enter uh, CNS, but the work, ha ha we are carrying on that experiment as we speak. Yeah. Uh, when you combine the vaccines with the checkpoint inhibitors, the pd one your control was um, the free vaccine, not nanodisc vaccine, right? What, how about, did you ever compare vac nanodisc vaccine with PD-1 compared to nanodisc vaccine alone? Oh yes, uh, we have shown Who's that better? data actually. So we, with uh, vaccination alone, we see extension of animal survival, but not cure. But with uh, dual uh, immune checkpoint blockers, now we see complete eradication of tumors. So this was the data. Like in the same experiment? Right, in the same tumor model, um, if you give a vaccines alone, we see um, extended animal survival, but eventually they all succumb to tumor. But with a combination of nanodisc plus immune checkpoint blocker, we see a complete eradication in 90% of mice. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, why we think we, are, uh, uh, we need to combine multiple agents. The vaccines will expand the number of uh, soldiers, T cells, as well as the repertoire of their receptors. And then when we combine with immune checkpoint blocker, we can fully unleash their full cytotoxic potential. Yeah. Um, James, when you look at the T cells, you have to show that 7% are activated T cells, T antigens. Is it that most of those represent a single or just a couple neoantigens and mm -hmm. you're taking a lot of sort of shots on goal? Mm -hmm. Or does that represent a lot of different T cells to many different neoantigens? So that was with a single antigen. So depending on what tumor models we use, we put either one antigen or multiple antigens. So in this model, we put only one antigen uh, shown here. But within melanoma model, we put three new antigens together as well as in GBM models. So in that case, and also in a clinical setting, we would go after multiple antigens. And uh, the phase one clinical trials I mentioned, they use anywhere from 12 to 20 personalized cocktail of antigens, and that's what we are envisioning that we would, we would be doing. And in those we're using multiple, do you see expansion of T cells to multiple of those? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, much. thank you. for coming today for our first Precision Health Seminar. Like I said, our next seminar is going to be in November.
So there's much more to come in terms of precision health. Um, but the next event is going to be on Wednesday, November 7th um, at 4 p.m. on the engineering campus where we are going to have our second seminar series. Um, and our two speakers are Max Stein, who comes, us, comes to us from the College of Engineering, as well as Mark Keel, who is, I believe, the VP for Research at Genomina, um, which is a Ann Arbor kind of University of Michigan startup company. So that's kind of um, putting research into action uh, down the business development 